Mr. Candela, I think you're up, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, counsel. My name is Anthony Candela, and I represent uh, Felix Ortiz. I'd like to reserve three minutes, Your Honor, um, if I could. Yes, sir. All right. um, Mr. Ortiz's case comes to you after a jury trial uh, in which he was convicted on a two-count information for unlawful sexual activity with a minor and contributing to a delinquency or dependency of a child. This, uh, this appeal deals primarily with count one. Count two is not, is not really an issue for, the, for this court's consideration. Um, the statute that we're dealing with in terms of the conviction, 794.051, and at the trial, counsel for Mr. Ortiz uh, requested a, uh, not a special jury instruction, but a lesser included jury instruction, 11.8, which was uh, committing an unnatural and lascivious act. And that's discretionary with the trial judge, correct? To give that instruction or not? <sighs> well, it's permissive. It's not it's mandatory. It's so, permissive, correct. It's yeah. permissive. It's not mandatory. However, if, um, if there is some evidence to support the instruction, the, uh, the prevailing rule is, is that the rule that the instruction should be given well, that's the difficulty in this case is there was no evidence to support giving it. I mean, this was um, conventional sex. It well, wasn't I, anything uh, beyond yeah. that. And well, there was no evidence to suggest that there was. Two, two things to that, Your Honor. One, the information, uh, the cases that were relied upon by the, by the trial court uh, was Knighton and Harris. And both of them dealt with 800.04, which is the lewd and lascivious statute, which this court is very familiar with. However, the information in this case did not, which the information's on record, uh, page 21, did not uh, allege penis to vagina sex. It just said being a person 24 eight, uh, years of age or older did engage in sexual activity with JR, a person 16 or 17 years of age. And then uh, the sexual activity is not further defined um, in that, in the way that instruction is 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 uh, laid but out. Sexual, but sexual activity is defined under that statute. It, it, it sexual activity is, Your Honor, but it can be a, it can be several different things. It can be penis to anus. It can be mouth to anus. It can be mouth to penis. It can be so much, so many different things other than it, penis to vagina. But don't we need to go, but but don't we need to look at the evidence here? So how was the evidence here at trial? How does that support a natural act? A couple of things. The the victim, um, JR, uh, testified at trial that she was unsure about what exactly happened to her. She was completely um, uh, incapacitated in some fashion because she was uh, intoxicated beyond belief, according to her, and that she re recognized that someone had had sexual intercourse with her, sex had had some type of sexual intercourse with her, but she couldn't tell you what it was, okay? She well, she said, well, well, don't we have, we have, and I realize this is the subject of one of your other issues, but don't we have the um, voice messages where she talked about she had pain um, from sexual intercourse? She she did she did talk about the pain and that was a, that was an issue um, that I raised about the um, excited utterance and the and the spontaneous statements, uh, which is not really dovetailing into this. I, this is more of a kind of a straightforward argument. But yes, Your Honor, that is what that is what she said. But she also then said she wasn't sure. She never actually testified straight up. His penis went in my vagina. She said I, I didn't know. So then we're left with circumstantial evidence as to what exactly happened. Now, could we make that leap? Sure. Could we also make the leap that he had um, anus, uh, penis to anus uh, sex with her, which is quite possible because there was remnants, um, DNA and other um, biological evidence that was collected from her, um, from her, from below her vagina and around her anus, the, I believe it's called the antio, the word is uh, escaping me here for a second, the antio. Um, we know what you mean. Okay, but it, but it's not, it's not, with that being there, 
there are different possibilities that the and and this is a question for the jury to decide not for the court to limit the jury's ability to make that determination i mean he could have done all sorts of ridiculous things that we would find probably unsavory but but, it, but don't it, we but but where in the evidence other than when she mentions pain from sexual intercourse does she mention pain from any other area she doesn't but she doesn't also say the pain is in my vagina she says the pain is down there she the my understanding of what she said was the pain is down there down there can be your anus down there can be can be your vagina um i'm not trying to minimize her but i'm but i'm what i'm trying to say is is that the facts in this weren't clear weren't, weren't clarified and i think because they weren't clarified that the that the the situation lends itself to uh, an issue where um, the court should have given the lesser included, uh, it's a category two, I get it, but lesser included uh, offense of unnatural and lascivious. Now, mm -hmm. my, can um, I, Mr. Candela, can I shift gears on you? I think we've covered this topic pretty thoroughly. I'd like to shift gears on you on the more difficult um situation of the unobjected to improper statements by the prosecutor during closing argument. And you have to meet a standard of fundamental error. And the statements that I'm concerned about is um, the ones that uh, suggest that she has no motive to lie. So it's a gratuitous statement by the prosecutor that she has no motive to lie. And you have, you have argued that's fundamental error. So help me with that. I, I will, Your Honor. And, and, and looking... <laughs> I, I, I come before the court and I've come before the court on, on this issue a couple of times where the defense attorney fails for whatever reason to make an objection. I'm not sure why they don't, but this is where we find ourselves. Um, but I, I, in, 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 arguing, in arguing this case, if you were to just look at the evidence as it, as it lays out, you have a girl saying that she was abused and that she was essentially raped, and then you have DNA evidence that suggests that it was the perpetrator. To start making arguments in the fashion that the that the state was 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 raising just adds a layer to this that's unnecessary. And I believe that that is where we get into this fundamental problem. Now they're not objected to. So, but, as but isn't the judge going to instruct them at the close at, at the end of all this? that the jury has a right to believe or disbelieve all or part of any of the testimony of any of the witnesses. So isn't, isn't motive about what statements are fair game? Well, yes and no, okay? Nowhere in the, this was rebuttal argument. This wasn't, this, this wasn't the initial argument. This was the rebuttal argument by, I believe, uh, uh, ASA Padgett. And she was responding to the, defense's summation. And nowhere in the defense's summation did the defense argue that, that J.R. lied. There was never that statement. And I get that. I get that. And, that's and, why I call your attention to the jury and, instruction that the judge is, is always gives and did give in this case, that, that the motive of the witness's testimony is something they have a right to, to balance and decide. I, I think they do, Your Honor, but... The problem is, is that this was a, a unique theme that the prosecutor, and a very effective theme, I might add, that the prosecutor wove in um, and looped in in her argument about why would she lie? Why would she lie? Why would she lie? And the more that this looped in, if it was one, one instance, I don't know that this argument would make any sense. But because it became a theme, it becomes a, a bolstering argument where you start to say to your, you know, you start to say to yourself, huh? You know, the state's pointing out that she must not be lying because they're asking the question the way they are. It, it's a it's a bolster to her to her to her position, and I, I think that um, had the defense attorney Wouldn't bolstering chair, be I know she's telling the truth or things like that, which was not said. Bolstering would be, you know, the dialogue with the prosecutor was asking the jury to consider what the judge was basically going to instruct them shortly thereafter. Well, yes, I, 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 I understand that. But what the problem is, is that she, her argument is equally as strong without saying, why would she lie? Here's what the evidence proved. 
she testified X, Y, and Z. Getting up there now saying, why would she lie, enters into a, uh, an element that's not, it's unnecessary and suggests to the jury, hey, she's not lying. Hey, she's not lying. Hey, she's not lying. Just because you're asking it in the, in the negative, why would she lie? It, it doesn't uh, necessarily um, uh, change the, the bolstering part. Because wasn't, I, wasn't wasn't that argument really in response to statements that were made by defense in their closing argument that Mr. Ortiz told you the truth? I mean, isn't that just a, a response? If he's telling you the truth, I mean, then they're really implicitly saying she's lying. So, I mean, isn't that a direct response to that? And isn't that um, something they should be able to respond to? Well, Yes, I, I, it could, Your Honor, but then the rule, the, the exceptions to this rule about bolstering and, and who's lying and who's not lying begin to swallow the rule. And while they argue that the defendant argues that he's right, so therefore the state can argue that they're right. And since the defense didn't argue that he's telling the truth, now we can say she's not lying. And the, the case law on whether you can use the word lying or not is it's kind of exacting in how you can do it. It's got to be supported by the evidence. I don't know that anywhere in the defense's closing argument, he, they argued he's she's lying, he's telling the truth. I think they just argued he's telling the truth. Um, can I shift gears on you again? Sure, Your Honor. <laughs> I want to go. I, I, I don't want you to run out of time. You got a bunch of issues, and they're all interesting. So I want to make sure we get a chance to touch on them. So yeah, the, the next point is that you argue that the trial court erred in denying the, the motion for judgment of acquittal on the basis that the state failed to prove your client's age, because oh. age is part of the proof that has to be established here, that he's of a certain age, the victim's of a certain age, and, and your position is there is no proof of that in the state's case in chief, and what happened after the state's case in chief does not save the day. It has to have been in the state's case in chief, correct? Correct, correct. And the case law is very clear on that. That if the defense puts on a puts on a case in chief, if they sub submit the necessary evidence to uh, correct something in the state's case, that that's that, that's because they have the burden of proof. That doesn't rise to the level of defeating. So, is it your position there was zero proof of his age at the state's case in chief? No, but the, the only evidence, well, here's, here's where we get into a very unique situation. The defense attorney didn't make an objection. So we're stuck with, is this a fundamental error or not? Which I, the fundamental error thing will, will, will be the bane of my existence as long as I do this. But the, uh, the only evidence of his age was the hearsay evidence from the detective reading off a report uh, and claiming that he gave his date of birth and therefore we can work backwards from his age. So it's just the hearsay evidence. And then there's a there's a position that I assume that the other that the that the AG is going to take is well the jury could observe him and therefore determine that that hearsay hearsay is enough. It, it's not that hard when someone lives in the state of Florida to send up to Jacksonville to get a birth certificate and say this is the defendant's birth certificate. It would be unimpeachable, unassailable. And that would prove or, or use DMV records to prove their age. There's well, we sit here all the time and second guess what lawyers do in trials. And, and it's, it's not fair for us to do that in the heat of battle that decisions are made and things of that nature. But you're right. There, there are always better ways to do these things. But the question and, here is, did they do enough? I don't think they did. And that's why I raised the issue, because I think what they what they they kind of threw this out. Oh, his age is, you know, by the way, detective, how old did he tell you he was? And, um, and I don't, they didn't even throw it out that way because that would be an admission. They threw it out as our police report says he's this, he's, he was born on this day. And then they left it at that. I don't know that that's enough. That's, you know, I don't know where that evidence came from. I don't know if the, if the, the police saw, and we don't, again, without an objection, I am stuck with, is this a fundamental proof error? versus um, an attorney error. And I think it's a fundamental proof error, which comes slightly under the, 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 the fundamental error because it's an element of proof that the state has to put on. And I don't know that they, that they did it other than to throw out 
uh, some hearsay evidence. Um, obviously, the judge considered it, and she didn't think much of it. So that was, you know, that was what we, that's what I ended up with there. Can I go to another issue now? Sure. Okay. I'm just trying to work them down. Okay. Cause you're, you're at 15 minutes and I, you know, you got two left. So I just want to give you a chance to touch them all. So you've argued that it's fundamental error to allow the nurse practitioner to testify as to why there were no injuries to the victim. And you claim this is a Daubert violation that, um, you know, that she hadn't been properly qualified to take that position. You want to elaborate well, was, on that a little bit? Sure. There was no predicate as to how she was going to come to that conclusion. Um, and the, uh, what I saw when I was looking at this and when I was briefing it is that she's commenting on the absence of evidence without any, without any explanation as to how she gets to come com to comment on the lack of physical evidence. Um, and I don't know that, you know, she's no different in terms of what she does. She's a nurse practitioner. She's essentially a collector of evidence. Um, you know, there, there is some testimony in these cases where they do, they do prescribe some prophylactic uh, medication to kind of say, well, we're treating the client, but they're not really treating the person as the as the evidence shows. They're just there to collect the evidence. She wasn't listed as an expert witness in this case. She was listed as a fact witness, and she then testified that, in her opinion, here's why you don't find certain evidence. And I don't know that a police officer could do that uh, if they came upon a drug scene or or a shooting. Say, well, we didn't find this evidence because, in my experience, we don't find this evidence. I, I don't know that that's acceptable, and I think that would have. How does how how does our case in Gessler versus State not put your argument to rest? And you've got ten seconds to answer that question. <laughs> um, can I reserve on that question, Your Honor, and think about it? You, you can, and you're not you're not you're not bound to to the three minutes of rebuttal. It's your time. You use it any I, way I would, you want. My job is just give you a warning. No, no, I would like to, I would like to reserve on okay. that and, and then be All able right. to address anything that my count, my counterpart. Okay. So, so you stop in here? Y yes, okay. sir. <laughs> All right. You have three minutes when you come back. All right. What says the attorney general? Good morning, your honors. William Schuller, office of the attorney general, representing the appellee of the state of Florida. Uh, your honor, as to issue one, uh, the permissive lesser instruction, um, I dealt with this in my brief, uh, but counsel brought it up in, in that Knight in and Harris dealt with sexual battery versus unlawful sexual activity with a minor. But it's, it's not necessarily what the charge defense is. It, it's what the activity alleged was. Um, and I know counsel said that there was no specific mention of penile to vaginal intercourse. Uh, that's just not true. The victim testified that, and this is from T-172, she then felt someone, quote, insert himself into me, and it was clarified that this meant uh, penis to vagina penetration. And then we get to exhibit 3A, which was the first of the voicemail recordings. Um, I had sex, and I don't know with who, but I can feel it. My vagina hurts. Um, so again, in order to get that permissive lesser, both prongs have to be met. It has to be alleged in the information, and there has to be some evidence adduced at trial. Uh, the state would agree that prong one is met, that the charge of sexual activity could necessarily encompass unnatural and lascivious acts. It's just here prong two was not met in that there was no evidence adduced at trial of anything other than penile to vaginal intercourse. Uh, I also made a harmless error argument uh, uh, as well. And as this court, I'm sure, is aware that the Florida Supreme Court has el uh, eliminated the jury pardon doctrine. Um, here, the jury was charged that they should find uh, appellant guilty uh, if the evidence uh, was sufficient to overcome beyond a reasonable doubt. So they were charged to find for the highest offense. Uh, here they did. And there is no right to a uh, necessary or permissive, or excuse me, to a permissive lesser instruction uh, in that instance, because the jury pardon doctrine no longer exists. Uh, in exhibit, uh, excuse me, issue 2A, um, I think it's important to note that the prosecutor never said that the victim isn't lying. Uh, she said, what motive does the victim have to lie? And I, again, I cited it in my brief, uh, the Johnson case, um, 
quote, it is also proper for a prosecutor to ask the jury to consider what motive a witness would have to lie. Uh, and that's from Johnson, which is a fourth DCA case. And the Supreme Court adopted that holding in Valentine v. State, which is a 2012 Florida Supreme Court case. Um, and I think Judge Smith pointed out um, that the defense implicitly argued that the victim was lying because he told you the truth. They did not have sex. So that's commenting that Appellant's version was the truth and therefore the victim's version was a lie. Um, issues three and four uh, as to the defendant's age, um, I would argue, um, and this is from a fourth DCA case, uh, Adamson versus RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company. Uh, hearsay received without objection, quote, becomes part of the evidence in the case and is usable as proof just as any other evidence, limited only by its rational persuasive power. So the detective testifying, although it might have been hearsay, we don't know because no objection was made and um, we don't know what predicate it would have come under, uh, but that evidence is just as usable as any other evidence in this case. So there was direct evidence and there was also circumstantial evidence. And I talked about that in the cases that I cite, uh, specifically the Sarin case, where the jury had the opportunity to observe a pallet over a three-day trial. They learned that he had a 16-year-old daughter at the time of the offense um, and that the victim considered him an uncle and referred to him as such because she was date he was dating her mother's best friend whom she thought of as an aunt. So because of all of those reasons, uh, the jury had ample direct and circumstantial evidence that the victim was well over the age of 24 at the time of this offense. Um, and I, Judge Smith uh, pointed out the Gessler case um, that is from this district um, that says it's okay that a nurse practitioner can testify about um, given the nature of the abuse alleged physical injury may not be observed on examination. Uh, I would also note that there was no objection to the nurse practitioner's testimony, nor was there a uh, pretrial motion and limit for a uh, Daubert challenge or made a trial. Uh, we don't know what the factual findings of the trial court would have been had this been properly preserved. And I don't think that this court is necessarily in a position uh, for appellate review to decide whether this is admissible under Daubert when there is no proceeding held below addressing that. I would rely on my brief for the remainder of my arguments. I would yield the rest of my time if there's no further questions. And I would ask this court to affirm appellant's conviction and sentence. Thank you, sir. Candela, back to you, sir. You've got three minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, going back to the initial argument about the, about the permissive second uh, category two, one of the arguments that counsel made uh, against against this was this card case and card has nothing uh, cards not like this case card had to do with uh, a homicide and a completely different type of um, special jury instruction this isn't a special jury instruction this is a standard jury instruction that has to do with with the lesser um yes there 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 is um, some evidence like the like the state pointed out that this was vaginal sex there was also some evidence that suggested that it was not and if there's evidence to suggest that there's not just like in a just like in a self-defense case if the evidence is very slightly you know slight enough that that self-defense could could present itself you're entitled to it I'm not asking for a jury pardon we're asking for uh we're asking for a um a determination on a theory of defense which you know this court and other courts in this state and country have said that the defendant gets certain instruction if they meet um if it's part of their defense and it, and there's evidence to support it no matter how scant um and there was scant evidence to support it and by not giving the instruction they, they cut off uh that or foreclosed that ability for the uh, defense to put that on the other um thing that i would go to is on the uh, on the improper closing arguments these things are brutal and 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 the court in an adversarial system these things tend to become a hangup for me because the state has a responsibility to try the case on the evidence before it and not go outside the record to try to get a conviction. Looking at the facts in this case, putting aside all the things that I've raised, this is a pretty cut, straightforward case with not a lot of 
uh, twists and turns. And to start introducing things that have no business uh, in the case, like these improper arguments, is just wrong. Um, and I think that, you know, I, that this court has struggled with these improper arguments for, for many years now. And I don't know what the right answer is, but I know that these arguments should not see the, you know, they should not be in courtrooms because there's a danger that you're convicting someone on an argument outside of the evidence. And that's just not permissible, regardless of how guilty somebody might be or, or not be. So, and, and Mr. And Mr. Candela, you know, as far as whether they're improper or not, if that was just solely the test, then we wouldn't be here making this, you know, having this discussion on it. It, it, Unfortunately, here they're they're unobjected to, and you have to prove fundamental error. And so we have to show that these statements so pervaded the trial that the defendant didn't receive a fair and impartial trial. And and I don't know that that can be said. And and I and I don't disagree with I don't disagree with the court. What I'm three saying, minutes, sir. So if you would just answer her question and wrap it up. What it, what it is is that I just they, Your Honor, there's a there's a part there's a there's a there's a there's a moment in a trial. When these things are just unnecessary, no matter how guilty, and at some point, the, the pendulum has gotten to the point where it swung too far to the other side. Where now we have to say, well, how did how did it affect us? Because it was un, unobjected to, and, and I, I don't know the answer to that. However, I would ask that on any one of these issues, if the court were to find for Mr. Ortiz that the um, the case be reversed and remanded for a new trial. Thank you both very much. Thank you for your briefs, your oral arguments. They were well presented. They're helpful to us in resolving this case. This case, like many criminal cases, always raises issues that cause you to think about our process and how we do things. And I'm grateful for what y'all did today. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Our next case will be Satterboro versus State Farm.